upload. Going to upload the video as well, so everybody can look at it later on. Um, and let's get started. So let me switch. Okay, awesome. So this is um, systems engineering. I use the term systems engineering just to as an overall uh, subject. But in reality, the, the class is, is a, a class in which we have undergraduate and graduate students enroll. And there's two different codes for the class. Uh, it's IE 4399E for Introduction to Systems Engineering. And this is the, the code for the undergraduate version of the, of the class. And then we have IE 5397, System Thinking and Analysis, which is the, the course for, or the course um, code for the graduate version of the class. Uh, but in general, it's gonna be the same class. Uh, you're all gonna be together in this virtual environment uh, while taking the class this semester. And we're gonna start with uh, a course overview today in which basically I'm gonna give you an introduction to systems, what systems engineering is. And also we are gonna spend some time looking at the uh, the syllabus for this class and uh, the rules for the semester and so on. So as you know, this is a, a virtual uh, class. It's an online course and it's going to be offered throughout the semester as an online class. We are going to talk about the dynamics uh, in this lecture on how that's going to be achieved uh, please feel free to ans ask questions as we go, as, as we move forward. If you don't want to interrupt the lecture, you can just put a, a question in the chat and I can try to address that question as soon as possible. So let's look at the, the material for today. Uh, so again, these are this is the same class, but there's two section numbers and two different titles for the course. It depends on whether you are undergraduate or graduate student. Um, I'm going to be your instructor. I am, uh, my name is Eduardo Perez. I am uh, an associate professor in the Ingram School of Engineering. Uh, I'm part of the industrial engineering group. Um, and as mentioned earlier, this is going to be a virtual course. Uh, and the meeting times for this class, the class is scheduled for Tuesdays and Thursdays from 3.30 to 4.50 in the afternoon. Uh, in terms of the agenda for today, we have the following items that I would like to discuss, including the introduction and motivation for this class. So wh what are you gonna be learning? Why is this class important? What is it part of, what is, why is this class part of the uh, of your curriculum or as an elective for the industrial engineering program or for the graduate um, master students. Um, we're gonna go over the syllabus. Also, I'm going to provide a, a, a small introduction uh, about what I do in addition to teach in as part of a faculty, uh, as a faculty member at Texas State University. Uh, also, I want to spend some time talking about how to communicate via email and other issues. Okay, so, so let's start with the introduction to this class and hopefully I can motivate you to, to learn and to enjoy this class as much as I enjoy teaching it. Uh, so this is uh, the first question that I typically ask in the, in the classroom. Uh, what is systems engineering? And I know there's some of you have had know a little bit about systems. Typically, uh, when you mention systems engineering, some people will think about computers, like uh, being a computer engineer. That's not what we refer to uh, systems engineering in this class. Um, the function of systems engineering is to guide the engineering of complex systems. Um, and this is a, a field within the, with the, all the other engineering fields that is becoming a lot of uh, very popular lately. Uh, as we move forward with the development of these large um, systems that are used for uh, societal 
for the benefit of the society. Uh, we can think about uh, the, the electricity power systems. We can think about uh, their uh, airports. We can think about the defense system. All those are very large, um, complex systems that are part of the society. And if we talk about like the space, uh, the NASA, all those projects that are part of NASA right now, those are projects that require a lot of um, guidance uh, in terms of engineering those missions and involves a lot of pieces. Then when put together, they form a very complex system. So the function of a system engineer is again, guiding the development of such uh, complex systems, developing or guiding the engineering, the development of those complex systems. Um, so, there are many definitions. Again, there's many professional societies that are uh, involved with, with these uh, specific profession. Um, the American Engineers Council for Professional Development has defined engineering as the creative application of scientific principles to design or to develop structures, machines, or manufacturing processes or works utilizing them simply or in combination, or to construct or operate the same with full cognizance of their design, or to forecast their behavior on the specific operating conditions, all as respect an intended function, economic of operation or safety to life and property. So a very dense definition about uh, what engineering is, but this is relevant in terms of putting within the context of, of this class. Um, so before we, we, we move forward uh, in terms of defining and motivating the, the importance of this subject or the systems engineering field, uh, it, I, I believe it's always important to, to take a step back and, and really understand what this word systems mean. Um, so a system, again, when we look and we separate it from what, typically you will see like as a system, um, is a set of interrelated components working together towards uh, some common objective. Okay, so anything that is has interrelated components that when you put them together are working to a, uh, to a common objective is what we call a system. A complex system involves uh, components that are diverse, and also those uh, have relationships that are intricate. So for example, a washing machine is not complex enough to require systems engineering. It's a system that we have uh, used for many years and it's well understood. Uh, so maybe the components are not as diverse because they, they have uh, become already well known. Uh, there's no need for you to develop a new uh, component uh, or new a new system within the washer machine. Uh, so uh, from that perspective, we can say that it's not complex. If you look at the structure of, of many different brands, you will see the same uh, type of system. So a washing machine is not complex enough to, to require the, the level of understanding or the discipline of systems engineering. Um, Another definition for systems engineering is an interdisciplinary approach and means to enable the realization of successful systems. So this is a very important uh, aspect of systems engineering that for interdisciplinary means that you require, it requires the knowledge from different fields. Uh, if you are trying to deal with the problem, let's say of, of right now that we have COVID-19, if you try to um, do vaccines or uh, distribute vaccines in, in the nation, uh, that is a, a problem that requires a system. Uh, it's a complex endeavor uh, and will require many disciplines. Uh, so that in that sense, it becomes in the interdisciplinary. It's not just the engineers, you need people from healthcare, you need people from maybe social sciences, maybe you need people from management, people from uh, supply chain, um, 
transportation engineers. So the whole goal will be to uh, distribute the vaccines, but uh, it becomes a, a, a complex system, an interdisciplinary system, because in order for you to achieve that goal, you need all these different disciplines working together. Um, so systems engineering can be um, a, a, a um, discipline that could be used very effectively to achieve those goals. Uh, so as a system engineers, you, you try to bring those disciplines together and you try to enable the processes that are needed to achieve that common goal. In this case, the distribution of the vaccines. Uh, it focuses on defining customer needs. So you need to know what the customer's needs are. And so we, that's the main, one of the main focus. We want to understand the problem. We want to understand what the core customer is, is requiring from this, uh, from this system, or basically what, are, what is the problem and what are the requirements from the customer perspective. And then based on that, we try to determine what is the functionality, um, how this system should work in order to achieve those goals, uh, we document those requirements, those functions, and then proceed with the design of the system and then later the validation uh, when looking at the complete problem. And this, all this information that I just shared in this slide is coming from the International Council of Sy on Systems Engineering. So I, I mentioned Again, the, the, the example on, on the vaccine, but there's other examples of complex systems. We can look at transportation systems. So how to, for example, um, manage a, a float of, of, of airplanes. Like if you're working from, if you're working for, I don't know, Delta. Uh, so how to schedule, how to make sure that you have all the pieces together that you need for the airplane to um, to be able to work properly. Like when they land, you have all the overall systems working to put the, the airplane back to work for the next fly. Uh, how do you make sure that you have uh, presence in each airport at the required time? How do you make sure that you're uh, looking at the schedules, people are arriving on time and so on? So transportation systems are one of those uh, major uh, examples within systems. So train systems, uh, chips, uh, railroads, uh, the subway, for example, those are major complex systems. Uh, the telecommunication examples, tele telecommunication networks. Uh, so we're, how to make sure that you provide the access to internet for example, in, in different areas of the nation, uh, how do you make sure that the system is resilient? Like if you have a tower that is not working, let's say in Austin, Texas, and that tower goes down, how do you make sure that you still provide the service to the people in Austin, San Marcos and San Antonio? Uh, so you have to have a system that is, uh, has some backup options and then and, and, and people will continue to receive the access of the service uh, and so on. So this is also a major complex system. So making sure that not only you design a good telecommunication network, but also is a network that is reliable, that system is not going to be on, uh, interrupted from day to day and that people can trust your, your service. Uh, so another big example, um, a, some historical examples, uh, war system. So how do you define a strategy? How do you define the movement of, of the um, equipment that is needed to achieve the, the mission? Uh, so this is also a, a field systems engineering that is well uh, known within the, the war system, within the uh, army, the Navy, the Air Force, and so on. Uh, power systems, uh, again, another complex interdisciplinary uh, system. So it's not just providing uh, power to houses, but also how do you keep the, the system re uh, resilience? Uh, if you have a natural uh, hazard, 
you make sure that the system is providing the system the the service that is required to the people um how do you make sure that you expand uh, as population growth how do you make sure that uh you 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 are using the latest technology to provide clean energy and so on so uh very difficult complex systems uh, uh, and then they're they're definitely part of what we study as part of systems engineering um one question that i always receive uh from from some students is uh how is systems engineering and, and other disciplines related uh, so the this is a a, a something that we've been seeing in in Lately, I will say in the next last 15 years, uh, the field of systems engineering is becoming part of industrial engineering in a sense, uh, because we as industrial engineers uh, study these tools that are uh, designed to uh, make systems more efficient. Uh, initially, we were focusing on manufacturing industrial systems, but Throughout the years, we have realized that these tools that we learn are also applicable to other systems that are not necessarily manufacturing or industrial. So things like service industry, hospitals, banks, uh, transportation, uh, power supply. So there's many other areas uh, for which um, industrial engineers are, are realizing that their tools can be useful. Uh, but in addition to that, there's a lot of overlapping between the, the, the use of the tools uh, or how systems engineering and the tools that are teach in industrial engineering are, are used to achieve the goals within this discipline. So, so you will see that if you go online and you do a search for industrial and systems engineering, you will see that there are other universities that have named the industrial engineering departments with the name of industrial and systems. Um, and that's the reason why, because throughout the years they're becoming, there's, be, there's a lot of overlapping among the two fields. Uh, so systems engineering is focused on the system as a whole. It emphasizes its total operation. So when I say a system as a whole, we are not just looking at uh, if you, for example, look at a transportation system, uh, you're not just looking at how this bus is operating. Like, is this bus that goes through San Marcos arriving on time? Uh, is this bus using uh, the right uh, route to uh, get to their passengers? Uh, no, but what we do within systems engineers, we don't focus on the specifics at that level. We focus at the top level. Uh, how is this system in general? Like if you look at the whole transportation system, not just a bus route, but the overall performance of the system, um, is it performing efficiently? Like for example, are, are, are we, how, how often, what is the average uh, percentage of on-time arrival of all the buses? Or uh, are we um, covering the, the routes where people are expected to receive system, uh, to receive service, I'm sorry. Are we um, making sure that we are using the, the routes that are less congested when we are um, driving our customers to their desired location and so on? So the goals are look at the, from the large perspective, from the uh, macro perspective of the overall system. It's not just focusing on a specific piece of the system. Uh, so while the primary purpose of systems engineering is to guide, this does not mean that systems engineering does not themselves play a key role in the system design. Systems engineering bridges the traditional engineering disciplines. As I mentioned earlier, it's an interdisciplinary approach. Uh, so we need people from multiple disciplines to achieve the goals of our complex endeavor or, or project or system. 
So one of the major obstacles to successful systems integration is the fact that a big part of the job is in building system is done below the subsystem level. And we're gonna talk about this later on. Uh, so we have different levels. Um, as I mentioned already, uh, we look at the problem from a macro perspective, but at that top level, we know that there are multiple levels under that. <clears throat> One of those levels is the subsystem level. So there's a point in which you as a systems engineer have to real, uh, you have to say, okay, I'm going to be looking at the performance from this level up. And then from the subsystem level down, I'm going to be relying on people that are expert on a specific disciplines. Um, so these different dis disciplines are listed here. Uh, for example, power engineering, structural engineering, mechanics engineering, data systems engineering. So the idea is that, you know, you have this complex endeavor. There's no way that you can keep track of every single detail of the development. But then up to the subsystem level, you're going to rely on those experts to give you the information that you need in order to make decisions at the macro level. Uh, because most engineers are trained in disciplines, they tend to pick up that disciplines as their worldview. Uh, there's a saying that say, when your only tool is a hammer, all of your problems begin to look like a nail. So the, the idea of, of what we are trying to say here is that if you, again, what you're trying to achieve is an interdisciplinary approach to solve a problem, but within this interdisciplinary approach, you know you, that you're gonna have experts in each discipline. So the goal is for you to be able to get these people that are experts on specific areas to work together to achieve a, a, a solution for the problem uh, of a major complex endeavor. Uh, so systems engineering is a discipline which enable us to look at the whole system and understand its integration and interactions. Um, so moving forward, this is basically a, a, a representation of what I just uh, mentioned. So if you are an expert on a specific area, then typically since you are uh, well uh, known on the concepts of that area or that uh, discipline, your design is going to be um, mostly uh, guided by those uh, concepts that you know for sure. Uh, so the idea here is that you have a design coming from different disciplines of an airplane. And depending on the point of view of your discipline, the design is going to be impacted by the knowledge of that discipline. Uh, so these are resulting aircraft design if one group is dominant. Uh, so you, you can see the uh, controls group, you can see the service group, you can see the wing group, uh, the equipment group, the electrical group, and so on. So each this representation basically has uh, an overload of the components that will be part of a specific discipline. Uh, another example, a Navy guided missile project. Um, this is a, a real example, and I'm gonna be bringing some of these uh, real examples of systems uh, designed by, let's say the uh, NASA, and the Department of Homeland Security and so on, uh, as part of, of the case studies that we are going to discuss in class of, of systems that were successful and systems that were failures. And, and we are gonna discuss those as part of this uh, class. Um, but they, in this particular uh, Navy missile project, uh, the engineering proceeded successfully until the missile components began to be assembled and tested. So this is, let's talk about this, the structure of this uh, missile. You, you can separate this, let's say in, in five to 10 parts. And, and the idea specifically for this example is that uh, a, a, a single group was assigned to each part of the, of the missile design. So they work on designing and uh, creating 
uh, a specific part of the missile. However, uh, when they tested those parts, the parts were, were performing as expected, when, but when they put the whole thing together uh, and began, began testing the assemble, they, they noticed that they neither sufficiently, the components were neither successfully stable nor independent enough to each other. Even worse, adjustment of one component affected the performance of other interaction components. Um, so even though they were working on the specific parts and the parts by themselves were working well and were tested and were performing as expected, since there was not a integrated approach for the, the designing and building this, this missile, when they try to put everything together, the system was not working. So the problem effectively stopped after an extensive redesign and was accomplished. And this happens more often than you would think, especially within um, all these agencies that are part of, of building these major endeavors, these major, uh, or trying to find solutions to major problems, or trying to define uh, new systems or new equipment, new technology. You will see that there's a lot of failure and a lot of uh, money spent on redesigning to make sure that the thing works as expected. Uh, and again, I'm going to bring some of those examples to class uh, as we move forward in the semester. Origins of systems engineering, we can go back to the pyramids. Uh, there's a lot of theories about how these were built. Uh, this is again, a major endeavor that require uh, uh, complex engineering. And that's why we can trace back the origin of systems engineering to, to this uh, age. Um, another historical event that impacted the, the definition of this as a field, it's an engineering field, was the Second World War. Uh, for this, uh, there was a requirement of military technology advancement, which stimulated the development of systems engineering. So again, a lot of uh, technology was developed for this war, from telecommunications to uh, aerodynamics to the uh, atomic bomb. So all this um, and there are these complex uh, systems were developed using uh, what we know today as systems engineering. Uh, during the Cold War, uh, the development of, of airplanes, also some new tanks uh, and the submarines. Uh, more importantly, uh, what we know today as uh, uh, computers and uh, data centers, uh, all these developments that we have today started with uh, discipline of systems engineering. So how do you build these components so when they put together, uh, they can develop a, or they can perform as expected. Um, development of other systems engineering there's three areas that are really important. Advancing technology, which provides opportunities for increasing system capabilities, but also introduces development risk that requires systems engineering management. Another uh, area is the competition, with very forms require seeking superior and more advanced system solutions through the use of system level trade-off among alternative approaches. So, one example that I always mention is uh, the cell phones battles between uh, um, uh, Apple and Samsung. So they're always looking for superior designs uh, so they can go and market the systems and get the, the, the population acceptance for their devices. Uh, specialization, which requires the partitioning of the system into building blocks corresponding to specific product types that can be designed and built by specialists and strict management of their interfaces and interactions. Uh, advances in technology have not only extended the nature of product, but also changed the way that they are engineered, produced and operated. Um, 
I always bring the example of uh, Tesla uh, when they developed their uh, the first plant uh, for producing their their first electrical car. Um, they they tried to use an old plant for I think it was from General Motors to uh, redesign it and and produce their cars, and they were not successful because since the technology using their cars were so different, they they couldn't reuse most of the existing um, equipment and, and robots that were already in place for that old plant. So advanced technology uh, extend the nature of the products, but also change the way they are engineered, produced, and operated. Uh, the applications of new materials, devices, and processes whose characteristics are not yet fully measured or understood increase the risk of encountering unexpected properties and effects that might impact system performance and require costly change, changes and program delays. So for this, that's why testing is very important, especially if you're dealing with new materials. Uh, failure to apply the, apply the latest technology to system development also leads to risk. One of the most important areas of systems engineering is uh, when you're developing all these complex new systems, uh, that you are always taking into account what is the risk of, let's say, bringing a new technology or bringing a new material to your design. Um, so how do you measure that risk? How do you test against it? And how do you and what's the level of risk that your system as you as a designer are, are willing to accept for your design. If you can think about the different missions from NASA that uh, went wrong because of a, a component that was not designed properly or because the testing was not done properly. Uh, so this is what we are referring to in this last item. Uh, the Apollo program, that was one of the major endeavors by NASA uh, to put a man on the moon. It is necessary to extend the limits of technology in many areas, such as rocket propulsion, life support, automatic navigation, flight control, and many others. Uh, and the risks were well dealt with such that the mission was successful. Um, competition trade-offs. Defense systems, the competition is caused by the potential adversaries, competitive contracting for the development of new system capabilities. In developing a commercial product, there are nearly always other companies that compete in the same market, as I mentioned, for the cell phones. Uh, the competition among the essential characteristics, performance, cost, and schedule of the system is always a major consideration in, in its development. And we're going to talk about these three areas a lot this, I'm sorry, this semester, performance, cost, and schedule. All of the forms of competition exert pressure on the system development process to produce the best performing, most affordable system in the least possible time. Uh, so one area that we are going to study is what is called the trade-off analysis, which is the examination of numerous alternatives and is required to select the most desirable approach. So what do we mean by the most desirable approach? Let's say you have three designs for your uh, system or the system that you're trying to, or to solve the problem that you're trying to solve, you came up with three designs. So as we mentioned already, there's these three competing areas, performance, cost, and schedule that you have to take into account to make this trade-off analysis. So sometimes the best performance is produced by one system, but when you look at the schedule, that system is gonna take you five years to be completed. However, you have another system that may, maybe it's not performing as well, but you can put it to work in one year. So the decision is, are you going to wait five years to get the best performance or you can accept a lower performance for a system that can be ready faster. So that's what we call a trade-off analysis. And it's the examination of numerous alternatives uh, and making sure that you understand what you can sacrifice or not in order to achieve that goal. Uh, we, 
we talk about the development of tanks. So this is one of these historical examples of a system. This is a TE-34 tank. Uh, it was a tank with the best balance attributes of firepower, mobility, protection, and rushness. Although its battlefield effect effect effectiveness suffered from the unsatisfactory ergonomic layout of its crew compartments and scarcity of radios. Uh, but often this tank was has been uh, created as the most effective, efficient, and influent tank of the Second World War. Um, in terms of specialization interfaces, uh, each engineering specialty has developed a set of specialized tools and facilities to aid in the design and manufacture of its associated products. Um, so the idea is that every complex system that performs a number of different functions must of necessity to be configured in such a way that each major function is embodied in a separate component capable of being specified developed, built, and tested as an individual entity. Uh, so if you think, for example, about computers, uh, there these are multiple uh, pieces that are put together using different interfaces for, for it to work properly. Now you have the motherboard, you have the RAM, you have the uh, CD drive, if, if you have a PC, and so on. So that's what we refer to. Like these are parts that when you put them together through these interfaces, you can achieve the, the goal of the system. Um, so it is a problem to make each component fit perfectly with other components functionality interacting with it. The intercomponent boundaries are called interfaces. Again, think about airplanes. When they arrive to the airport, they have these interfaces for, uh, for maintenance and those are available in any airport. So when you land, uh, they have the, the right connections to use in your airplane and you can interact with these airport through those interfaces. Um, high degree of modularity to make the interfaces as simple as possible for efficient manufacture, system integration, test maintenance, and in service upgrading. Upgrading again, you think from a computer perspective, you can upgrade the RAM, you can upgrade uh, the, the processors, uh, and you don't have to, I mean, you might need to uh, re rerun some of the programs, but in terms of switching components, it's pretty easy. And that's the example that we are presenting here. So you can see all the pieces, uh, you have the motherboard, you can switch, uh, some of these components, the external components also, you can switch your keyboard, you can switch, switch your uh, mouse, uh, the screen, all that very easily. Same idea uh, to a larger um, extent, uh, the Air Force plug and play satellites. So same idea, you can go uh, and switch some of these components on these satellites uh, to improve their performance. So some additional examples of systems requiring systems engineering, they're listed here, satellites, air traffic control system, clinical information system. This is from a healthcare uh, perspective, uh, aircrafts, modern harvest combined, uh, refineries, auto assembly plants, electric power plants. Um, here's a, a representation of a car. So you can see that uh, a modern car will have many uh, subsystems and they need to have some interfaces. Also, um, as we move forward with the uh, technology, uh, there are cars that you can right now connect to the internet and that facilitate the, um, the assessment of their performance. Uh, most of electric cars are um, and so on. So you can detect if something is not working properly right away and then you can try to fix those problems easily. Um, this is an example of a hybrid car. So again, as we move forward with technology, different 
type of, of systems allowing you to achieve the, the same purpose. Um, and the systems engineering viewpoint, uh, as we mentioned already, the systems engineering viewpoint is focused on producing a successful system by understanding user needs and focusing on their satisfaction, balancing superior performance with affordability and timelines. So this is related back to what I mentioned, these three pillars of schedule performance um, cost. So how are you gonna perform the trade-offs? How are you gonna define or de decide which system is better for you? Looking at, the, at, the three, at these three areas. Applying new technology and managing resulting risk and seeking the best overall balance among the conflicting objectives. Uh, so again, this, this is related to the airplane example that I showed you earlier. So depending on the viewpoint of one of the disciplines, then you get to a specific design um, so, but the overall goal as a systems engineer is that you want to take all these disciplines together and you want to, using all their knowledge, um, find the best design for the goals that you want to achieve. Uh, same thing here. These are real examples of, of different airplanes that were focusing on specific areas of the design. Uh, the Supermarine Spitfire. Uh, this was optimized for aerodynamic performance, but it has suboptimal stability and a nasty spin mode. And then we have the GV. This is a racer. This was optimized for engine and minimal drag, but it was very suboptimal in terms of controls. Uh, we have the YV49. This uh, optimized for long range by aerodynamic performance in large wing tanks, uh, but it was suboptimal for stability and control. And then we have the uh, Gossamer Albatross. This was, the mission was human power flight. And this was optimized for minimum weight and maximum lift so that the vehicle could fly within performance of human engine. However, it was suboptimal in terms of strength. So it was very fragile. Um, getting almost to the end of the introduction. So major challenges of systems engineering. Uh, one of the major challenges is the engineering system is to get all the parts, components and, sub and subsystems to work together. Getting them to work together, understanding, controlling their interaction is called systems integration. So uh, hopefully this a uh, short introduction can uh, give you a flavor of what to expect in this semester. As I mentioned already, we're gonna touch in many concepts related to the design of complex systems. I'm gonna bring some case studies for you to study. Um, and then using that information, we are going to um, learn how to design a complex system. And you're gonna apply those concepts to the design of a system as part of your project for this class. So let's talk about the syllabus. And I was curious to see if there's any questions at this point, any questions? Okay, so I see that we have 24 people connected. That's good. Um, so let's continue with our discussion. So now the, the syllabus. Um, the syllabus is available. Let me end the slideshow. So if we go to Canvas, here's the, the Canvas site for this class. Um, and in here you have this link, uh, yellow link. You can download the, I mean, let me just show you your, the way that you see it. 
Okay, so this will be the course syllabus. You can click here and you'll you'll get the electronic copy of the syllabus. And as I mentioned in the email, you can click in modules and then you will see here for every day of that we meet this semester, you'll find a module just like this one. And if you have an assignment, it's gonna be listed here for that day. Uh, the Zoom link if is here with the password and then the slides for today are listed here. Okay, so, so that's how you get access to uh, the material uh, that we are gonna be covering through the, the semester. Um, we go back to this. Um, so let me share my screen again. Oh, the screen is already shared. Let me just do this. not what I want. I'm sorry, just Okay, here we go. So let's talk about the syllabus. Um, so in my, um, my information is listed here. Um, the, the best way to connect with me is via email. You can send me an email uh, to the email address that is listed here, also in the syllabus, or you can use the Canvas email option to email me. All those three are good. Um, if um, I also have a LinkedIn and a Twitter account, I just use that to share opportunities with the students. So if you want to connect with me, you're welcome to do that. Uh, if I see that there's an internship or it's a job offer or job opportunity, I'm sorry, available, I typically share those via uh, LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, so that's why I use those two uh, in particular for those purposes. Um, virtual lecture, lecture time. So I have uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays from 3.30 to 4.50, which is the scheduled time for this class. Um, so there's this link that you already used to connect to today's lecture. Uh, this is the link. Um, and then I have virtual office hours on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 2 to 3.30. You don't need a password for that. Uh, so you just can click on that link and that will be available to help you from 2 to 3.30 p.m on Tuesdays and Thursdays or by appointment. So if you cannot meet with me during that period of time, uh, send me an email and we can set up an appointment. So the password required to enter the lecture meetings will be provided via email. Uh, so the lecture, the, the, the I'm sorry, the, so the password, I, I didn't send it via email. I just put it next to the link the password will be the same. It's not gonna change. So every time you have to connect, just use this password. Uh, so it's not going to change. The password is systems. Um, Dr. Perez? Yes. Uh, so are, are we going to be having uh, live meetings? Yes, so um, I'm, I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. I, I just just wait a minute and I'll, I'll talk about that. All right, thank you. No problem. Uh, so the question was, are we gonna have live meetings every day? So I'll get to that in a minute. Okay, uh, so the teaching assistant is status is pending. Uh, we're gonna have someone helping us. It, it's a graduate student uh, that is studying the class, obviously, uh, that will be grading the, the assignments for the class. Uh, I'll be in charge of grading the exams. Okay, so this is a very dense slide. I'm not going to read through it, but these are the course objectives. Most of the information that you're gonna see here it's not, you're not necessarily familiar with it because there's a lot of concepts related to systems. Um, but 
it'll be good for you to read through them so you know what to to expect and then as uh, every um lecture i kind of point to which objective we are trying to address uh from this uh list uh so make sure that i mean i'm gonna make sure that at the end of the of the semester we have covered them all okay so this is going back to the question from the student uh so how how we will sort pursue these objectives. Um, so the lectures, uh, I'm going to record the lectures using Zoom. So every, so the lectures are going to be recorded. Okay, so they are not going to be live. I'm going to record the lectures and I'm going to post the video every day at the, on, on the day of the lecture. So I typically uh, make those modules available early in the morning on Tuesday, in this case, and early in the morning on Thursday. So, so that gives you the flexibility to watch the video during the day and not having to wait until the, the time of the class uh, in case you have that flexibility. But I want to clarify something. I'm still gonna connect on at the lecture time to answer questions. Okay, so if you have any questions that you want to ask me about the lecture material, I'll be connected at the beginning of the class to answer those questions. Okay, so I just want to make sure that you understand that I'm going to be available during the lecture time at the beginning of the lecture time in case you have any questions about the video that you're watching for that day or any other material before that. Okay, so one more time, the, the lectures are going to be recorded. Okay, so I'm going to give you a, a video with the lecture. You can watch the video, but I'm going to be available every Tuesday and Thursday at the beginning of the class in case you have any questions about the material that has been covered in the class. So I want to give you that flexibility, that access uh, if you cannot access during the office hours, you can still connect at the beginning of the lecture on Tuesday and Thursdays, and you will have the opportunity to ask questions. And if something needs to be discussed, discussed further, we can do that at the beginning of the lecture um, or during that time for, for the lecture. Does that, does that make sense? Is that clear? Yes. Okay. Okay, so you don't have to, I mean, I'm not going to be taking attendance. This is uh, only if you need to connect to ask questions, you can connect during the uh, schedule time and I'll be there to answer questions. Um, so as I mentioned already, Dr. Perez will use the modules tools within Canvas to upload the lecture videos list the assignments and due date and provide additional instructions per lecture. Uh, lectures will be conducted following the schedule stated on the syllabus. Once posted, the video lectures will be available for the students to access them anytime during the semester. Students will be notified when videos are posted using Canvas email too. Assignments, labs, and projects. Uh, the assignment labs and projects will be posted in Canvas using the assignment tool um, so I'm going to let you know uh, when the project instructions become available. Uh, I'm going to send you an email. Um, the project is a group project and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, students will upload their solutions in Canvas using the assignment tool. Feedback and grades will be available in Canvas in the grades tool. Uh, the exams will be posted and available in Canvas following the schedule stated in the syllabus. So for the exams, which I have the, the dates already, so I'm going to show you those in a minute. For the exams, you need to connect during the, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the exam is going, are going to be available during the scheduled time for this class. Okay, so you're going to have an hour and a half to work on the exam on the scheduled date and you have to access the exam during the scheduled time for the class. The exams are going to be available in Canvas, okay? Um, 
Dr. Perez will design the exams to limit academic dishonesty. We had a, a case last uh, semester. Um, well, I had a case of a couple of students that were processed for academic dishonesty. Uh, I know this virtual environment is different, but remember, just try to do your work. Um, if, if, if something happens and then you, you have to be processed, it's, it's a very, uh, I don't know, it's, it's not a, a good thing, something that you wanna go through. So make sure that you do the work, you do your work and everything's gonna be fine. Uh, Dr. Perez will use the quizzes tool within Canvas to administer the exams. So questions about the exam. Good. Um, and if, again, if you have questions and you don't want to ask them now, you can email me and we can talk individually. Don't, feel, don't be afraid. Uh, even if you are not in the classroom in a face-to-face -face environment, feel free to ask me questions via email or feel free to send me a message saying that you want to connect to talk via Zoom. Uh, that's fine with me. I'll make the time. Just make sure that you uh, communicate anything that you have to discuss, reach out to me and we can discuss. Um, the speakers will hold office hours and schedule in the syllabus and we'll use some to communicate with the students uh, during the office hours. And it will be available to the students online during the office hours. Students will be able to join a Zoom meeting with the professor without an appointment. So if you wanna join during the uh, schedule office hours, you just have to use the link that is available in the syllabus or in the slides, okay, to join the office hours. There's no password needed for the office hours. Uh, the course textbook, I have the book here. What is it? Um, here. Uh, this is the book. I'm oh, sorry, let's see. Systems engineering. I think we have access to the book online. So it's not uh, something, I mean, through the library, I think you can access the book. Um, so you wanna look for that. Um, we have access to it, I think, online through the library. Uh, I'm gonna be using other references, but this is the, the book for the, for the class, uh, Systems Engineering Principles and Practice. Um, and then the course website is Canvas. So we're gonna manage everything through Canvas. Um, exam homework and lab. So these are the, the dates for the exams. I typically, when I schedule the exams, I don't change the, the dates. So it's almost 100% on almost 99% that the exam are going to be happening on those dates. Uh, so if you if you cannot take the exam on those dates, uh, I think I have a note in the in the syllabus. Just notify me, and uh, if you are sick or anything like that, just bring a, a doctor's note, and we will work together to reschedule the exam. Um, homework or assignments will be assigned. Uh, they are due at the beginning of the lecture, um, so meaning that. At 3.30 for this class, the uh, homework will be uh, needed to be submitted. Um, submitted work must be professional presented without exemption. No late work will be accepted. Makeup assignments will not be given. Any student who fails to submit a graded assignment on time will be awarded a zero score unless there exists legitimate uh, medical emergency reasons and valid documentation is furnished. Uh, labs are Practice problems assigned during the lecture time. Um, you'll be required to work and submit your answer before the end of the day of the class period where the lab is assigned. I think this, this for this class, I might be a little bit more flexible because this class is offered late in the afternoon. So I might give, I mean, depending on the, on the, depending on the assignment, I might give you an extra day to work on, on those labs. Uh, but if it's something short, 
you you probably be able to submit the date. Um, I'll be now. I'm gonna ask you to submit the same day, uh, maybe by 12 p.m. on that day. Um, this is. I mean, I use the lab to make sure the students are connecting and are following the lecture material. Uh, so it's important for you to make sure that you connect on uh, every day for for this uh, or for the scheduled day and time for this class to make sure that there's no lab assignment so you don't miss the the points that are associated with the labs. So the labs are easy scores for the class. Uh, you just have to make sure that you are submitting them on time. The semester project uh, students will form semester uh, some will form semester teams comprising of one to three students. Each team is going to work on an interesting real life problem of their choice and apply the systems engineering approach to model, analyze, and design systems uh, for for the problem. Students are encouraged to work on problems from their thesis. If there are master students. Each team will learn how to use Ms. Microsoft Visual to develop all the systems engineering documents for the project. Uh, finally, each team will write every project report and will do a class presentation for the last week of the class. And these presentations will be recorded. Um, so I'm going to provide you with the instructions for the project um, sometime uh, in January, probably at the beginning of February. Um, so I just want you to, to start thinking about who can you work with if you want to work in teams. Uh, always, I mean, you have the, the option to work by yourself. Again, you can work by yourself or you can create a team of up to three students. Um, so you have access to the emails of your classmates. Let me just do this. Um, like if you go to Canvas, you can look at people. And these are the people that are uh, currently in the class. So if you want to reach out to some of your classmates to discuss uh, whether or not you want to work together, I think this will be the best way to find out who's, who's with you. Um, so you can use those tools to reach out to um, your classmates. Um, okay, so the project proposal will be due on February 16. This is a very short document. I'm gonna give you a, a template to follow. Okay, so uh, don't worry about not having enough time. You will have enough time because it's very short. Um, the only thing you have to worry about now is to form a team if you want to work in teams and also to think about a problem a, and and this will be more more clear after we go through the first couple of lectures a problem that you would like to work on uh, to develop a system um, and then we have the midterm report and the project report on may 11 which is the day of the final exam, but instead of scheduling the final exam on that day, I'm gonna give you until that day to submit the project. Any questions so far? Yeah, did you say that we could, uh, can we work alone? Yes. So you, you it's, it's one up to three. So one means that you can work individually, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Obviously, I'm going to expect more from a three student team than from a one student team. So you need to be aware of that. Um, so expect more in terms of the details and so on. Um, so we're going to talk more about that, but that's the expectation. Like if you have three students working in team, the expectation are a little bit higher. And my experience, and it's not always in it's not in each semester is that students that work by themselves sometimes they generate better projects that students that work on teams but in other semesters that's the opposite so it's not like one student cannot do a high level project that i have seen that before so one student three students just make sure that 
uh, you cover all the, the the need for the projects and uh, if you have a, a three team students that you make sure that everybody's working uh, in the project and that's easy to to see when you look at the, the report. Um, the course grade is a follow so we have 25% uh, for the homework and labs, 25% for the exams, each exam, and then 25% for the project. I followed the standard curve. Uh, I reserve the right to curve. I typically do, uh, but not 100% sure. Um, it depends on the performance of the class. So that's why I always encourage you to do your best. Um, if a test is missed, you must have a written authorized excuse. If possible, please let me know before the test. Otherwise, I must be notified within two weeks or two days of your return to school. Missing an exam or quiz without a written authorized excuse will result in a zero grade for that item. Uh, so make, make sure that if you don't get to, I mean, if you're not available the date of the exam because you're sick, just let me know before the exam. And then after that, just provide me with an excuse and we can reschedule. Uh, any disagreement regarding the grade received on any material must be discussed within one week of the return of the graded material. This is just to avoid having to discuss the grade of the first exam, the last day of the semester. So if you don't like your grade for the first exam or you think that something was not fair, just reach out to me within that week and we can discuss. The worst thing that can happen is that you end up with the same grade that you have. Okay, so you're welcome to discuss anything that you feel can be um, improved and we can talk about that. Academic integrity is the responsibility of the students and instructors to help maintain scholastic integrity at the university by refusing to participate in or tolerate dishonesty. Okay, so plagiarism will not be tolerated and will result in death in this course. If you have any special accommodation needed for the class, I know that we are have this virtual environment, but if you need any special accommodation, just let me know via email and we can discuss. I will do my best effort to accommodate your, your needs for the class. Uh, this is the topical outline um, per, per day for the semester. So we're gonna try to follow this as, as much as possible. Uh, but, and this is for your reference. Um, email, um, so we are running out of time. So I'm, I, I would like you to look through this. Essentially the most important thing, and I'm sorry, because I have another class coming after this one. So that's why I, I had to make sure that I leave on time. So, so the email etiquette, basically what we, we are trying to, um, to address here is that we have gotten some complaints from em uh, employers or future employers in your case that uh, students are not are sending emails to them um, and this is from our industry advisory board and they are not necessarily receiving emails that look professional so with these slides and, and with this uh, email communication process happening this semester, I would like you to pay attention to these details because your future employers pay attention to this. Uh, so make sure that you, when you write an email, you write it in a professional way, um, that your your subject is clear, that you 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 have a salute at the beginning of the of the email that they have the text and that you you have your name at the end. Um, so so these are just guidelines, but remember that's the purpose. We want to train you to make sure that when you go out uh, for work, looking for jobs, that you are putting yourself in the best position possible. Um, so this is the basics. <clears throat> You have the name of the person receiving the email, you have the message, and then you have the uh, your name at the end. And you will be amazed uh, the type of emails that we get sometimes. Um, and, and I know we have to do better. So this is part of that process of, of training students. So 
emails, communication is important. Try to keep the email brief, uh, one screen length, respond to emails within the same time span you will do for a phone call. Uh, check for spelling, punctuation, and grammar errors before sending the email and use a professional font, not decorative. Uh, for the attachment, I'm, I'm very flexible. Uh, just make sure that the name relates to the document that you're sending. And that if you, if, and never try to submit a file if you are not, like for example, if I ask you to upload the assignment to Canvas, don't try to submit it via email. Uh, try to follow the, the instructions. Uh, unless you have a valid excuse and you are allowed to, to submit it via email. Um, you should email your teacher if you have uh, an easy question that can be answered in a paragraph or less. If you have an assignment that you're allowed to submit via email, um, there's our rules, some rules that is best to follow, such as don't try to turn in an assignment through email if you've been specified not to do that. Um, in our case, I mean, this second bullet will not apply, but if you need to get an extension, just send me an email. Uh, don't bring up any topic that will require require uh, continuous conversation. Like if you are not happy with your grade in the exam, it's better that we just set up a, a Zoom call and then we can discuss uh, because sometimes things can become heated and it's a large risk for on misunderstanding. So it's better to talk face to face. Um, final thing, this is a little bit about myself. I'm from Puerto Rico. I graduated in 2004 with an industrial engineering bachelor degree in science from the University of Puerto Rico in Mayagüez. I have a PhD in industrial engineering, graduated in 2010 from Texas A&M University in College Station, and also did a postdoc also at Texas A&M University. I finished in 2012. Um, I, I worked for a year uh, in the service industry for a bank between my with bachelor degree and my PhD. So I have experience in the service industry working for uh, bank industry finance. And also through my PhD, I did a couple of internship with uh, General Motors, um, but most of my latest work is, is with hospitals and with uh, government agencies. So as a PhD, as, as an associate professor, uh, we do a lot of research and my current projects are, are with the Department of Homeland Security. I'm working with them in uh, developing better ways to uh, get people safe uh, through the airports, like checking points, um, before you get to the, I mean, the checkpoints basically. Uh, so finding ways to improve the operation of the checkpoints in, in airports. I also do research with hospitals. So right now I'm working with the um, departments, uh, the Texas Department of State Health Services with the COVID-19 situation. So working on identifying ways to uh, improve um, the distribution of, of vaccines, PPE, and so on. Um, so we, we get busy and, and it, I mean, we have opportunities for, for research for, for students. So if you are interested in research, reach out to us and we can discuss. Um, anything else? Well, that's all. Do you have any questions for me at this point? So if there's no questions, then I will post the video and the instructions for Thursday. On Thursday mornings, you should have access to the video and the, the, the slides and the instructions for Thursday. And then I'll be available at the scheduled time. In, in, if you have any questions, you can connect and we can talk about those questions. And if there's nothing else, then... Yes, any questions? You, you mentioned um, research opportunities with yes. an internship. Um, there's, sometimes there are opportunities that are connected to internships. 
Uh, so if you are you want to get more information about that, send me an email and we can discuss. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? So if there's no questions, then I'll see you. Well, I will connect with you uh, on Thursday. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.